Peter, why is the current economic model unsustainable? I look at it in a divide. You have environmental sustainability and you have cultural sustainability. Environmental sustainability is very much recognized today. Everyone is talking about the need to not destroy biodiversity, to be sustainable within the resource consumption use. Everyone loves to talk about uh, you know, the necessity for these things, but yet no one seems to break it down to think about what the root cause of all these problems are. There's a recent statistic that was put out, two of them actually, over the course of the past three years, one in association with the United Nations that basically they said that after 10 years of trying to stop biodiversity loss, they've had absolutely no success. And in, I'm gonna have this in a lecture I'm giving uh, in a couple of days. They state, <laughs> they state that the reason that we can't do it is because all the money is going into industrial development and not into preservation. And this is a very red flag type of statement because of course nothing's gonna go into preservation. The entire economy is based on consumption. So you have laborers, you have employers, and you have consumers, and they're all consumers. You can take all economic theory and throw it out the window when it comes to this very core understanding and sustainability because this is all that matters, and I can't reiterate this enough. You have a machine of money that's circulating based on consumption. The, more, the faster it goes, that's called economic growth. It slows down, economic growth slows. That means people lose jobs. That means politicians are looked you know, negatively upon. The last thing any government wants to see is economic growth slow because it means they're going to be held susceptible. So you have all these factors that force economic consumption, which means forces resource consumption. So the entire facade of market capitalism looks at the earth as one big inventory. At its, four, at its core philosophical uh, foundation, you can't consider a society uh, of this nature and consider it to ever be ecologically sustainable. And that's pretty much all anyone ever needs to know. It's completely unsustainable and it will persist with all of the degradation that we see. There's another study that was put forward uh, with the University of Washington in association with the UN and they did a uh, analysis of loss of biodiversity. And when I say loss of biodiversity, I mean loss of life support systems. You know, not, not just rainforest depletion, fresh water. It's, you know, evolution has taken billions of years to create all these interworking, synergistic, and symbiotic systems on the planet. And we have come in in just a number of centuries, mainly one century, and we have destroyed and dismantled and messed this stuff up uh, to large degrees to the extent that we don't even know what the repercussions are going to be in the long run. So with that notion, uh, the United Nations and these other guys came together and said, what is, the, what is happening with loss of biodiversity and what's happening with consumption? And they calculated that we would need 27 more Earths by 2050 to meet the current rate and trends of demand when uh, what we get to be about 9 billion people, I think, by 2050. That's very, very despairing. <laughs> That's something that everyone should be talking about in sustainability circles. But they're not because everyone's terrified of addressing market capitalism because if you talk about the actual system problem, uh, you're going to be labeled very rapidly as something un-American or more, worse, uh, anti-freedom. And that's a tangent that I won't go too far on. But it's, uh, it's very unfortunate. Every activist uh, organization out there needs to look at the very root of market capitalism and its predication on scarcity and its necessity for constant consumption if they want to resolve the ecological problems that are at hand right now. Why do you think current activism efforts are failing? And why is reform of the current system not possible? Okay, I'm going to jump back to cultural sustainability as well, but I'll answer that question as well. Activism right now tends to take a localized perspective, as what you would call it in the sense of systems theory. Uh, as human education, excuse me, as human knowledge has evolved, we've become more aware of the fact that we're a part of larger and larger wholes. I mean, this is pretty much common sense, but you look at the core of history, uh, everyone looked at acts of behavioral, uh, excuse me, behavioral actions. They looked at uh, any type of causal effect in a localized reductionist way, and this still holds true with basic classical economics today as far as the way they perceive causality and incentive. And what that does is it removes everything that has a factor on, of influence and pressure. So if you take, say, Greenpeace, they are very, you know, very diligent about stopping corporate corruption as they would perceive it, say, you know, fishermen that go in and illegally overfish. But why are the fishermen overfishing? Is there maybe a market reason for that? Is there maybe a profit reason? Is there maybe a survival reason of why these people are doing that? That doesn't come into the equation. So the economic structure, which is the most dominant force of everything that we do in our society, is more or less ignored in its pressures amongst the entire spectrum of activism. Look at behavioral violence and, say, just crime in general. Someone, uh, someone uh, you know, 
someone goes and shoots somebody in an airport recently in Los Angeles, and we say, boom, that guy just must be messed up, corrupt criminal, uh, you know, let's remove him, let's get rid of that mentality, they'll say something like that in our traditional legal reference. But we have no idea what happened to that individual, what the pressures that have emerged around him to create that. Violence is a process. It's not a singular act. It never has been. And that's, again, it's sort of narrow, reductionist, localized view of behavioral causality that we see. So activism is going to have to start thinking about the system reference. You can't look at uh, the social system we have today. You can't look at economics or market capitalism specifically in the context of today in a reductionist view. You have to take a statistically broad view of what's actually happening and then you'll get actually a clear picture. Otherwise, you're just going to keep chasing little nuances that don't lead anywhere. And that, that, I could say a lot more about that. I mean, there's a whole subculture of people in the libertarian philosophy that see, they've created this boogeyman called the state. So they think, you know, if we just free the market and we don't have coercive policies and, and they talk about, of course, moral principles, which is usually a waste of time. The non-aggression principle is something that comes up. Well, that's great. You know, thou shalt not kill either, but that doesn't seem to have done uh, a whole lot just to tell people not to do that. There has to be a system reference. You can't have any behavior in a system that isn't reinforced by the system. You know what I mean? You can't have a, a if it's not structurally reinforced, it doesn't matter what your moral codes are, people are going to continue to deviate towards what is working and corruption and abuse and exploitation is what works in this model because it's based on that uh, fundamental predication when you really break it down because of its underlying basis and scarcity and I can't emphasize that enough. You talk about how the state exists now as merely a tool of the market. Can you break down the historical context of this relationship? Well, let's think about this. Uh, Neolithic, Neolithic revolution happened. We were all nomads wandering around with small tribes. And I'm sure there was some kind of regulatory tradition that occurred amongst any type of organized society, but it wasn't until we settled and we started to, you know, take land masses, have land masses near water sources, and we started to build, you know, civilization as we know it with uh, centralized communities. With that, there's an inherent need for protection in a scarcity-driven world. You know, obviously, if you're a small society and you're next to a really nice freshwater pond and you're in a region that doesn't have many of those, other tribes are going to start to run out of water and there's going to be conflict. They might come in and take your stuff, as has, of course, happened over and over again, as, of course, happens right now in the world today as well when it comes to energy resources. But, so you have to have, excuse me, you have to have uh, some type of protection system. So what does that imply? It means that some type of power has to be allocated to some subgroup, some, uh, some authority, and they are going to be given the right to have certain legislations put in place. They're going to be given the right to have control over others. Then you take the act of commerce, which has been around for thousands of years. This is one of the great failures of thought with free market uh, theory and this sort of libertarian concept and the truncated frame of reference that they have. It's not that the market started with Adam Smith. The market's in its core philosophical basis of specialization and trade and handicraft and barter and, and using mediums of exchange. That's gone back thousands of years. So we have tons of history to reference about what this type of patterning does to behavior and what it requires in order to regulate it because when you have a scarcity-driven system of commerce, you're going to have fraud. <laughs> you're going to have corruption. You're going to have people that are going to, for their own necessity, it's not that they're bad, but they're put into a position of pressure because of their survival, and they're going to do things that aren't necessarily equal. They're not necessarily balanced. They're not necessarily uh, uh, honest, I should say. And with that inherent quality, you need regulation. So the state was there to say, okay, here's a platform of rules that you're going to have to kind of follow. You know, if you guys, if this guy pulls this trick over here, this sleight of hand here, he's going to be punished by this policy and you're going to be rewarded this and that. Hence the nature of the legal system. That's the kernel of, of state regulation. Now, what's the great flaw with all this? In a monetary-driven culture, which is what this has all evolved into, what can money do? It can influence regulation. It can buy state power. It can morph itself directly into the edifice. And that's what the evolution has been. Mercantilism was sort of the reverse of this. Mercantilism was state monopoly driven stuff, like kings, you know, monarchs, they send out their little pirate ships with protection, and they go and they steal spices and slaves, and they, you know, they basically control everything from the top. Adam Smith came along and said, no, we don't like that. We're going to reverse the process. So we're going to say the market should be free, which in theory and poetry is great. But what happened, the corporate power, I shouldn't say corporate because that's actually a modern concept, the business concept, the business uh, enterprise, the business acumen comes forward and starts to inch its way back into the governmental apparatus, which it was always there to begin with, 
but it inches back its way in a different form. So it swaps roles, basically. Instead of state control of business, now it's business control of the state. What was the Bush administration? <laughs> Bush administration was representative power of the oil industry. What is the Obama administration? If you look at his actual active, active policies, he's representing the banking institution. The state has always been comprised, historically, one direction or another of the larger order of business powers, because that's what the world's driven by. It's driven by business, right? If you didn't have a focus on economics, then the whole system would dwindle away. You have to keep that pressure going, and therefore you are going to invariably have state and business collusion at all times. So nothing came before the other. It's a natural process of protection regulation, corruption of that regulation, which in truth all regulation is corruption one way, one way or another. The entire legal system with the police and everything is there in part to keep the, the lower classes in a position of control so they don't have the power to take the immense amount of wealth that has been already basically stolen by the upper classes. Now we have 40% of the wealth owned by 1% of the world's population. So you see how this synergy has worked out. So if you want to get rid of the state, you got to get rid of the source of it, which is basically scarcity. And then basically, if you want to get rid of scarcity in this modern world, you got to get rid of the market because the market needs scarcity. And I, I describe this from a standpoint of post-scarcity, meaning I am aware of the statistics and the trends that we have now that we can create a new social model, highly participatory, not central planning, not, not, uh, you know, not dictatorial, where you can create a new apparatus for social uh, interfacing in commerce and exchange, not exchange per se, but in the creation of ideas and creating facilities to initiate ideas and bring goods into service and everything else without the use of money, and hence, and hence creating a, uh, interest in, in abundance and, and post-scarcity. In other words, if you want to get rid of the state and this power consolidation process, you have to get rid of the market at this stage. Well, what's the train of thought that humanity needs to have to get on board with the social model that you propose? That's a, that's a long one. Basically, <laughs> it's sort of what I just said. Uh, it's well, the term I like to use coined by a great thinker of the 20th century, R. Buckminster Fuller, who did an enormous amount of research uh, numerically on what could be done to create a, a, a post-scarcity world where you can take care of all of humanity, he coined the phrase ephemeralization, which is equivalent to what a lot of people in the technology community call Moore's Law, or this exponential increase in information technology. And information technology basically just translates into applied technology in whatever purpose. Uh, it means doing much more with less and less, and that's been the trend in every every major industrial medium. Uh, look at a satellite. A satellite is made of very lightweight, very, very actually uh, non-rare materials, silicone and the like, and it's, uh, it might be complex in its design, it might be difficult to make to a certain effect, not as much anymore with mechanization, but this tiny little satellite floats through space and has so much more power than anything we could ever do with big arduous gauge copper wire moving it around trying to engage communication like that. So much more versatility, much less resources. The first computer was like tons. It filled up an entire room. Uh, it was, it, I think it took an enormous amount of power per cycle. Now our, and it costs millions of dollars, now our cell phone has chips in it that are more powerful, many times more powerful than this initial computer. This is the ongoing trend and it's something that needs to be pushed forward. We need to move, push forward with this process instead of using again the market which wants scarcity, which needs inefficiency. I can't emphasize that enough. You know, people say, well, the market, if let's set free, for example, as a hypothetical, will create this type of abundance. No, it won't. If we actually didn't go a month without buying something, the whole economy would collapse. You have to have this constant turnover. So the pressure works against abundance and scarcity, which means it, it continues to perpetuate inequality as well, which is something I want to mention in this conversation regarding structural violence before we end. Uh, so I'll leave it at that for now. We can do more and more with less, but we have to actually engineer our society to facilitate that to actually facilitate the interest to create an abundance, which is the exact opposite of what our system does right now. Elaborate more on the concept of structural violence. And that brings us back to the first question, uh, which I call cultural sustainability, or the fact that uh, our modern market economics, the economic system we have today is culturally unsustainable because it perpetuates inequality by its very design. It's inherent and built in. Uh, to explain that, all you have to really do is think about the fundamental kind of predicated incentive structure. Again, you start with scarcity, and then you see that in a scarcity-based driven worldview, narrow self-interest will prevail. And that's nothing obscure. Adam Smith in his epic Wealth of Nations talks about self-interest constantly as a virtue. Fair enough. But if you have a self-interested self -interested worldview in a scarcity-driven society, you're going to lead to competitive behavior. Competitive behavior will always 
always amalgamate in power consolidation like the state or how uh, the Federal Reserve works or how the FDA has grown to work. Again, massive collusion working for self-interest for small isolated people. And that's just what the market is. I don't look at the Federal Reserve as some anomaly. I look at it exactly as what we would expect from this type of society. So if you have these pockets of consolidation, if you have this constant interest in competitive advantage, you're going to have constant wealth imbalance as an math absolute mathematical result. Uh, you can talk about class war, which is an old term that's been used you know, in socialist rhetoric. Uh, the, in fact, the entire socialist outcry for the past couple of hundred years that led to the Bolshevik rev Revolution was basically entirely based on this class war, war uh, awareness. So those that deny that today, which there are people, believe me, that deny that class war even exists. They think that all trade is voluntary. <laughs> they think that... Uh, they think that there's no exploitation because everyone makes their own decisions in this this hyper reductionist free will notion, which is another uh, another tangent that I I could go on when I get to uh, structural violence. Uh, in fact, I should probably just jump into that right now. I think I've drilled in the fact that the system creates inequality. If you have inequality, you're going to have conflict, and you're also going to have this new phenomenon that hasn't been recognized in the past, and that's called psychosocial stress. And that's this relationship that, for example, I'll give you an example. Um, with uh, There's absolute deprivation and relative deprivation. We don't understand what absolute deprivation means. It's obviously, if you're poor, you don't get your needs met. And you don't eat well, uh, you might be susceptible to very toxic environments from your living conditions, et cetera. We understand that. Relative deprivation is actually much more uh, insidious because it has to do with our social nature and the way we perceive ourselves in the social hierarchy. We are deeply social organisms. It's built right into our evolutionary psychology. And when we see other people that are doing better or have a higher class status, which is exactly what the economy creates with this, this wealth division that's inherent, uh, it messes us up. It messes us up really badly. And this has been proven through a number of uh, uh, social research analysis and public health uh, for the past, I'd say, 50 years. It's fairly new, though. And if you're, say, for example, and I'll drill this in, I'll bring this to the class war concept, concept. If I put a gun to someone's head and shoot somebody, it's an act of violence. Say they're 50 years old and the life expectancy is 34, excuse me, 84. That means 34 years have been taken from them in a broad, you know, theoretical sense. However, if I take, that, take another person and I stick them in a poverty-stricken environment and they develop heart disease, which has been known to have an absolute direct link statistically to this low socioeconomic status, which isn't actually absolute. It's actually a, th these measurements have been done where if you're just in the existence of low socio socioeconomic status, absolute uh, deprivation aside, the relative deprivation, the stress of that, the, the way you think about yourself has incredibly uh, inhibiting effects on the way your body and your mind works. And you will develop high stress levels. You'll develop cardiac problems. You'll develop heart disease problems very, very, uh, very predictably in certain cases. And what if that person that has that heart disease dies at the age of 50 again, when they could have lived possibly to 84? Because they are in a position of poverty and low socioeconomic status, meaning, of course, that they don't have to be there. And this is the argument of the movement. There's no reason for anyone to be in poverty. There's no reason to, ha reason to have these massive wealth gaps. This is a traditional overflow. If it's not necessary, if it can be, it's like someone who's dying on the street uh, with, of dehydration, you hold a bottle of water over their head. Is the fact that you don't give them that water, even though it has nothing to do with you, if you have plenty of access to water, is that an act of violence? Yes, it is. It's like someone polluting a, a pool of water, a, a water supply, and it goes in, and 15 years later, it goes to the town, and people get cancer. They don't know why they've gotten the cancer, because they don't know the causality. But is that an act of violence if you did that? Of course it is. This is structural violence. And structural violence, in the broad scheme, which has been through uh, public health research, has killed more people than every dictator combined. It's killed more people than, than every war combined in the past 200 years since, the, since, the studies, since these studies became evident. Gandhi knew this immediately. He said, poverty is the worst form of violence. It's a great intuition. Martin Luther King talked about this all the time. Before his death, all he wanted to see was equal income. He said, let's, let's stabilize. This is economic bigotry, basically. Economic bigotry built right into the social system because of market capitalism's inherent propensity to create inequality, which people love it if you believe in social Darwinism because everyone walks around reinforcing forced to think that they're better than everyone else because of all their property and status. It is one of the most caustic things you can possibly do to a society is to generate inequality when it comes to public health. How can you get people past this blind spot and thinking that these unfortunate instances are just inevitable? I, I, I hope I explained fairly well that the 
scarcity-driven worldview coupled with narrow self-interest, which always gravitates towards competitive advantage, will always push that forward. Every act of commerce is an act of competition in some way. If you take a job, I want to get the highest possible rate from my employer. He wants to get the lowest possible rate. I'm just, you know, I'm just something else that he has to buy. If I engage in commerce, I want to pay, and that's why negotiation exists. The, the very term negotiation implies a type of conflict and warfare to get the lowest price for something that you want to buy. This kernel seed mentality of market competition is what has no, equi has no equilibrium. It can't because, in part, you will always lead to power consolidations and advantage, as with the state or mafia. <laughs> That's probably the best word that I would use to describe what happens in this system. And again, I don't look at the mafia as something that is uh, an amoral uh, an anomaly of this. I say that is exactly a, a, just a, a a variation of everything that's happening. It only happens to exist outside of what we consider to be the frame of, of, uh, of this playing field. If you look at, at I'll, I'll say it this way, if you look at macro, excuse me, microeconomic theory, like John Nash and the Nash Equilibrium and all these guys that came forward in the 20th century that really investigated capitalism, they will use only one theory for their, their perspective. It's called game theory. And game theory uh, is just that. If you're looking in a competitive environment, you're playing poker. You are going to win and some are going to lose. And with that, within that climate, you can't have uh, social equality. You can't have any type of equality, actually. Talk about where the Zeitgeist Movement is going from here and what the new book is all about. Sure. Uh, this text, uh, The Zeitgeist Movement Defined, is going to be freely available. It should be out by the first of the year. Uh, it will be sold in print form at cost. We're only doing that. I prefer people to download it or put it on a tablet, of course, and not waste trees. But most people still prefer to have a physical text. So it'll be on demand, and it's a nonprofit text uh, written basically by the whole movement through a whole, uh, whole assessment of data. And the, the lecture team and myself have been compiling this for some time. This will be, hopefully, the de a definitive reference guide for those that want to know about what the movement's doing. Because there's a lot of, you know, people have very confused notions about what we're actually doing. Uh, it's very, it's a deep learning curve. So we're hoping that this will actually uh, help a lot. It's taken years in the making to put this together. And I'm on my way to Berlin, as you mentioned, to give a lecture. I hate to say lecture. I don't know why I say it. I have to give a talk. It sounds so authoritative <laughs> to say lecture. I just do that. As, I don't know why. I, when I was a kid, I used to go to lots of lectures, so it's <laughs> drilled into my mind. But to give a talk on calculation in a new economic post-scarcity participatory economic model, which is what this is. And I don't want to dwell, delve into that because it's an enormous uh, conversation, but what I will say is that there is a way through modern technical means to refocus society towards an abundance-producing interest, an incentive towards an abundance to meet human needs directly, to get rid of social inequality, to make sure no one doesn't have a high quality of life in sustainability with the world around them, because that's the equation. Not you know to have a to aspire to a 500 room mansion with two jets parked in the front lawn, uh, with af the half of the continent of Africa as your backyard isn't just some gratuitous act of greed materialism. It's actually an act of violence, and it's time we realize that this has to be a shared planet. We can't have this ethic that we're just going to overrun people because we want the freedom to do so. And uh, it's also going to show, and this is my biggest point, that when you have a social model that reinforces social and ecological in interest. Uh, everything will change, and that's what our system doesn't do. In other words, self-interest, that driving little thing that we all have, and obviously when we're back to a quarter, we'll always predominantly be self-interested right into our evolutionary psychology. We're no use to, good to anybody if we can't survive ourselves and maintain a decent living and the like. That will be combined explicitly with social interest. Every act of engagement in this new model benefits everyone. And the beauty of it, and also, excuse me, but it takes the environment into direct account what, in, explicitly. And the beauty of that awareness is it really embodies a new incentive structure that can facilitate true cultural and environmental sustainability and actually generate a steady state relationship with the environment while also eliminating the caustic and destabilizing inequality that, will, that is continuing right now. I'm, it's, a, it's a shock that we haven't had nuclear war on this planet. Uh, yeah. um, it's, it's a shock that... I don't, I'm not surprised any time I see someone pull out a gun and just walk into some random building and shoot people. None of this stuff surprises me because the system is so caustic. It's so, um, there's a sickness bred into it that we have just accepted as normality. We have already had mass starvation on this planet unnecessarily. 
So I could ramble on a lot of stuff about that, but I think that's a good, you know. Well, people also think of the seizure of private property as a form of violence. So what do you think it's going to take for people to realize that this is completely unsustainable? Do you think that they need to be backed into a corner thinking that the world is going to end otherwise? Well, I, I don't agree with the idea that uh, we need some massive collapse. I think that awareness can work showing what's happening now and predict predicting the trends. I know a lot of people out there are like, well, We'll do this when there's a big collapse. Well, there's never going to be, <laughs> people think that way, there's never going to be some epic collapse that's final. There's always just going to be reduced, uh, reduced um, high lifestyle pockets of the planet. It's just going to keep reducing. Population is going to grow. Mass starvation will continue as it does right now. And it's just going to get smaller and smaller while more and more people die. And it's going to become more and more accepted. Again, just like we accept a billion people basically in starvation on this planet right now, we just accept it. And most people just accept it. It's not like there's a huge outcry over it in truth. I mean, humanitarian stuff is out there, but no one really thinks about this on a day-to-day -day basis. Though if you told people that we have mass starvation on the planet, they might think twice because they never think about it that way. That will just increase. So an educational prerogative is, is, uh, is, is imperative. And I do believe that once enough media is put out there, enough programs are put out there, such as the Global Redesign Institute concept that I've talked with you about before, which is a digital interface that will work to redesign the planet in a macroeconomic way to show how new, inefficiency, uh, new efficiency arrangements, excuse me, can be made to alleviate so many uh, footprint, footprint pressures and to create a very, very uh, fluid social organization. Uh, you know, no more sitting in traffic, you know, all the things that plague us on a daily basis that, again, we just accept as normality to create true social sustainability and true ecological sustainability on that level. That project, coupled with programming projects to show how we will actually calculate society, which, again, is what I'm going to talk about in Berlin. I'm going to present an algorithm, a macroeconomic algorithm, that goes through the sustainability protocols. And you can basically calculate, I don't, it's not a technical, that's not too technical for people to understand. A program is nothing more than a set of instructions. And what we need to do is create an, 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 an industrial system where we feed into it our interests. And this isn't science fiction, by the way. This is very easy to do. Uh, and then it does an evaluation of them based on efficiency protocols, which are tangibly, technically easy to, to just arrive at, and sustainability protocols. And once you do that, you have a filtration system that's monitoring the behavior of the society. It removes that opinion from society to a certain effect. Again, that's a larger conversation, but we're not, no one's going to just take people's property. No one, if either people decide to do this or they don't. I'm not, you know, I'm not advocating that anyone push someone over and, and demand this society. I do think it will be a natural gravitation. I do think that when the poor, the 99% as Occupy would say, realize this possibility, the game's basically over. Because the 99% way outnumber the 1%. And those that have this hyper mentality for private property and their basic elitism that's reinforced by wealth and class division, they're going to realize eventually, I think, especially with the ecological problems on the horizon, that that type of value system isn't going to work. Thanks so much for sitting down with me, Peter. It's always amazing to talk to you. Oh, thank you, Abby, for uh, your time. And, and you're a beacon of hope with your show. It's one of the best shows on TV, and I hope it stays there.